Grace and peace be with you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Westminster Presbyterian Church on this first Sunday in the season of Lent. And things are a little bit different here at Westminster. We are getting used to saying, but that's not the way we've ever done it before. We are once again doing something unlike the way we've ever done it before, which is confirmation. We are beginning the first Sunday of confirmation for our youth, uh, which is happening during worship. And as the youth are going through confirmation during worship, we have invited Reverend Amy Moore to lead our adults in a new stage in their own faith journey uh, during worship. Uh, and so, I um, wanted to let you all know that, yes, I will not be with you all for the next uh, five Sundays, but I will still be around, and we are working on a way to actually um, invite adults to come during the week and participate in the same type of confirmation class materials that the youth are getting, only they are only for adults. And so the youth's, uh, the youth's uh, homework before this class was to bring a photo of themselves that they are very proud of, and they were also supposed to answer the questions of uh, why, are you, um, why are you a Christian? And so if you would like to participate in an adult version of that class, that's your homework, and come let me know. But as we prepare um, to worship uh, today, and we do um, welcome those of you who are joining us in person, as well as those of you who are joining us uh, online, and if it's your first time uh, with us, we want to say a special um, word of welcome. Uh, and please do uh, see the notes about uh, Reverend Amy Moore, who is our guest, uh, our guest preacher for the next uh, six weeks in your bulletin announcement. Um, and Amy, I'm just so, so grateful that, uh, that um, you said yes. She said earlier, well, Alex, if, if you don't think you're a professional, I'm a professional, so two halves make a whole. And I'm so grateful to be, I'm so grateful to be uh, working alongside her. Um, but I would like for the youth to come forward, and if you all can stand right up here. We have Danny, and Lauren, and Jake, and Russell, and I would like for the congregation to please stand. And we are going to pray for you all. Can you all reach out your hands? This is our, our, blessing, our blessing pose. We are going to pray for, for you all. Let us pray together. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for Jake, for Lauren, for Danny, and for Russell. We give you thanks for the promises that were made on their behalf at their baptism and for the way we have raised them in the faith as the congregation of Westminster. We pray that your spirit would guide them as they continue their journey to confirm those promises, that they would be filled with knowledge and with depth of insight and with love of you through our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, you all can actually go ahead back to the classroom, and I will invite the rest of the congregation to prepare your hearts, to prepare your minds, to prepare your bodies for worship. I invite you to become still and focus on your breathing and to take a deep breath in together. We breathe God's Holy Spirit in, and we breathe out our worship and our praise.
You are invited to rise in body or in spirit and join in the call to worship. We are tempted to believe we aren't good enough, but God has called us beloved. We are tempted to believe that we should accept the ways of the world, but Christ has shown us the way to believe into a new life. We are tempted to believe the others should conform to our ways, but the Spirit has shown us that God has called all people into beloved community. We are tempted to fall in line and live according to worldly measures of success. Come into the way of God shown to us by Christ and follow the movement of the Spirit into new life. Come, worship God who leads us into life. Let us pray. God, our shelter and our refuge, in you we place our trust. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad in you all our days. Amen. You may be seated. Sometimes we become so routine in our worship, we may forget why we do something. This Lenten season, let's renew our intention the prayer of confession intends to prepare us for worship in heart, mind, and soul. Therefore, we confess before God and one another our sin and the sin of the world in which we participate. May these words spoken together sink from our lips into our hearts. May our prayer humble us before God and reorientate ourselves in relationship with God, ourselves, and one another. Let us pray. Jesus, beloved of God, you have shown us how to love God, to resist violence in word and deed, to speak truth in love, to love our neighbor. Yet we fail. Today we confess our thoughts and actions are too often violent. We speak too often without love, and we neglect our neighbor for our own sake. We give into temptation to nourish ourselves with things that do not satisfy, to idolize our riches and power, and to test God's protection. Forgive us, we pray. By grace, 
Let us live into the love Jesus showed us. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. As far as from the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. God's love for you is bigger than you can imagine. Children of God, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. and also with you. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, 
and in your will discover our peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Psalm 91, verses 1 through 6 and 11 through 16. Listen to God's word. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adler. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. We'll try again. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Because you know it's a gray day and dreary enough. I need a little light and sunshine in here. This morning, my husband brought this in from the garden. This was just a tight bud a few days ago, and now it has fully blossomed into what it is supposed to be. And I thought, what a perfect invitation to bring to you today, both to share its beauty and to wonder what will we blossom into together in this Lenten season. So thank you. Thank you for having me here with you for these next several weeks. And now as we turn to our scripture in the gospel, our second reading today, uh, we find Jesus standing on the banks of the Jordan River just after his baptism of repentance by John, and that is still soaking in. And as he's standing there, heaven suddenly open. And he hears a familiar voice. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. I can only imagine that in this moment, Jesus experienced an inner transformation and became acutely aware of his identity with God. Now, imagine he could have just ran off and started proclaiming this and seeking praises like, look at who I am. But what did Jesus do next? So let's turn to our reading from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, and hear his story. And again, I invite you to first settle into your seat, into a posture that enables your best listening to take a deep breath and release what distracts you, to take a deep breath and release what divides you. And as you listen, notice what you hear, notice what you feel, notice what you notice. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, one does not live by bread alone. 
Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you, I will give their glory and all their authority. For it has been given over to me, and I will give it to anyone whom I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy God, by your grace, may the words of my mouth be spoken right. May the meditations of our hearts hear you right. And may in our living go forth from here and live you right. Amen. Did anybody watch the Olympics? It kind of seems like a long time ago at this point already. (laughs) You know, I confess, I really didn't see much of it, but I do like the figure skating. And this might come from the fact that I took figure skating lessons when I was in elementary school. And you know, my little red outfit with the faux white fur on the collar and the sleeves, I looked pretty snazzy with this skirt that swirled when I twirled. But alas, as much as I loved my instructor, I really didn't absorb the things that she was teaching me and I didn't practice and I didn't learn any theory and thus I am not a skater. Nathan Chen, on the other hand, he is a skater. Chen first competed in his blue velvet suit when he was three years old, and the moment he stepped on the ice, he was a natural. But still, he needed to practice and strengthen and embody theory in order to live into a world-renowned skater. So heading into the 2018 Olympics, he was favored to win the gold, and he had his eyesight on it. He was consumed by the prize. His face was already on Wheaties boxes, or cornflakes, I think it was, so I don't, you know, misstate. He was also on a billboard in in Times Square. As the gold dangled before him, tempting him with a prize, For his knowledge and his expertise, he crashed and burned, and he finished 17th in the short program. Devastated, devastated, he called his sister with whom he shared a loving relationship and reached out to her for support. And she told him this. She said, I don't want you to think this defines you as a person or what you bring to the sport. And she related in an interview, the next morning he woke up a totally different person. Apparently in that moment, in that moment of loving words, Nathan Chen experienced some kind of inner transformation. And he let go of this temptation of a prize to fully embrace being himself. So with that, did you see his free skate, the long program? Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to entertain me for a minute. Because I think the music he chose was no mistake. He started slowly with the music of Elton John, The Yellow Brick Road. The words that go... When are you going to come down? When are you going to land? Goodbye, yellow brick road. You can't plant me in your penthouse. I'm going back to the plow. 
He skated smoothly and perfectly, executing these quadruple jumps and sow cows and all kinds of specifics that I can't name. But then the music transitioned into Rocket Man. And as the music changed, he, it, it, it went into this crescendo, and as it hit its top, he leapt into this triple, quadruple jump, and he landed perfectly. And in that moment, you could see he was fully himself. He was in the zone. He knew who he was and what he was there to do, and he was confident in it. The gold medal was no longer his prize. He was living into a loving relationship with his sister, with himself. This became his prize. Believing into who he was held way more power than the offer of a transaction. A transaction that if you do the mechanics, if you know the theory, if you make glory the goal, then you get the medal. Now, Jesus, you know, of course we have to come back to Jesus, and we know Jesus wasn't a skater. But Jesus was human. And I understand over the past several weeks, you have been exploring the humanity and the divinity of Jesus with Alex and Seth. So in the past two weeks, the messages came that Jesus fed over 5,000 people. And Jesus became dazzling in the presence of Elijah and Moses. That is pretty divine. And I will admit that most of my life, I have found it comforting to think of Jesus as divine. After all, the human standard he set is pretty kind of like out of this world. But last week, last week, Seth said this. The separation between God and humanity is something we have invented on our own. I would suggest that the separation we've invented, that God is there and we are here, is for our convenience. You see, you see, if Jesus is only divine, we can absolve ourselves of some responsibility because, you know, we're not divine. How do we live into that? So we can righteously worship Jesus and thank God we're forgiven when we mess up. Y'all seen that bumper sticker? I'm not perfect, but I'm forgiven. But if Jesus in his humanity is in complete relationship with God... Well, in that case, I think we are challenged to pay closer attention. This Lenten season, I would like to walk with Jesus as the disciples did, following his humanity. Jesus didn't state any doctrines or beliefs, but he lived into a full relationship with God. He boldly surrendered the pride of being right for a relationship of righteousness. Rather than seek his own power, he boldly surrendered to a powerful relationship. Every week on a Sunday, we might state that we believe in God. We even state we believe God's word. But believing into requires surrender to relationship, surrender of the ease of a transactional faith, a faith that says, if I go to worship on Sunday, I'm good for the rest of the week. If I claim the name of Jesus, I'm, I'm saved for heaven. If I believe a doctrine, then I'm a child of God. Jesus, fully human, did not live a transactional faith. But with acute awareness of his identity in relationship with God. In that relationship, acknowledging it and aware of it, he retreated into the wilderness where he wrestled with what it meant to live into that relationship. 
So rather than go off and seek his praises, he wanders off into the wilderness. In 40 days, he is tempted by the deceiver. That deceiver, friends, that deceiver is a crafty one. We like to name him the devil, but that deceiver is among us today. That deceiver believes in God. That deceiver also believes God's word. Because if you notice in our reading, he used that scripture. He was able to quote it for his own purposes. But I would argue from the story of Jesus' temptation that believing, that believing God and believing in God is not enough. Because James 2, 19 reads, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe. Hmm. I suggest then, it is believing into relationship with God that set Jesus apart from the deceiver. In each temptation, the deceiver used what Jesus believed in to betray his identity and abuse his power. Jesus believed in God. Jesus believed God. But more than that, he was believing into a relationship with God. Now, these three aspects of believing, believing God, believing in God, believing into God, this triad was first identified by Augustine, a fourth century theologian. He was translating from the common Greek of the early biblical writings when he noted this fascinating gra grammatical structure. Now, I know you might be saying, oh my God, grammar. But, you know, and I'm not usually very excited about it, but bear with me a second, because what he noticed is that what gets translated into English as in or into comes from the Greek N, E, N, or ice, E, I, S. Now, whether N or ice means in or into depends on whether it's used with an indirect object or a direct object. Simply put, simply put, for those who, of us who struggle, struggle with grammar, this means that the difference between in and into is whether or not there is movement. So this morning, when you got here, you came into the building. You were outside, and you came into the inside. In this moment, you are all sitting in your pews, in your seat. There is no movement at this moment. You're already here. It's a big deal, right? So what? Well, so what until we look at what gets lost in translation? So for the sake of smoothing out awkward phrases from the original Greek and the Latin that was used by Augustine, we lose out on some meaning. So hear this. In Luke 4, verse 1, the NRSV accurately translates the Greek grammar with N, in. And it reads, Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now, understood this way, Jesus was already in the wilderness, and the Spirit was leading him. That alone could be a sermon, a promise of the Spirit leading us wherever we already are. Now, compare this to both Matthew and Mark that use the Greek structure with ice. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Spirit took him there. This indicates he was outside the wilderness and the Spirit led him in. Now, these phrases make sense, this in and into. But here's another example of ice. In the same grammatic structure that does not get translated in our English with into. 
And this might be a familiar verse, so I'm just going to say it instead of telling you what it is. What difference might a translation make? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes into him may not perish but have eternal life. Not just believes him, not believes in him. Believes into him. It's movement. Or how about this? Mark 9, 42, if translated according to the Greek, ice, that structure would read, if you put, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of the little ones believing into me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. Not someone that believes me, believes in me, but those who are believing into me, if you make them stumble. I guess the deceiver was not aware of this when he sought to make Jesus stumble with his temptations. Believe into me, believing into God. That's an awkward phrase. But what does it beg us to consider about the human Jesus? There's a quote on the front of your bulletin by Dr. Natalia Cherry, and she relates from Augustine. It is one thing to believe God exists, another to believe God's promises come true and still a whole other thing to do what translates as believing into God. Even the demons believe. Like the deceiver, Jesus believed in God. Like the deceiver, Jesus believed God and quoted scriptures. But what set Jesus apart is that he believed into God, into the fullness of his identity with God, with relationship with God. So I just leave you that or this to ponder. What shall we be blossoming into? What shall we become? in this Lenten season. If the separation between God and humanity is something we have invented on our own, in this Lenten season, what shall we learn walking with the human Jesus, whom we call the Incarnation? Are we willing to surrender together and find out? I invite you to stand and turn in your bulletins to our offertory, our response song. Um, It's a setting of Psalm 31, um, which we have bilingually. We may tackle that at some point. Um, But uh, today we'll just focus on on learning, learning the music, meditating on the text.
That is beautiful. As we stand together to state our affirmation of faith, I call your attention to the words because they've been restored to the original Latin, from the original Latin language that reflected the original Greek, language that has gotten lost in translation through the centuries. So if you would, state with me the Apostles' Creed. I believe into God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe into Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe into the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may please be seated. Once again, uh, welcome. Actually, I've not said welcome. Seth, um, not Seth, but Alex, that guy, started out <laughs> welcoming you all to Westminster. But I again say welcome to Westminster. Those of you who are here, the saints that fill the pews that we cannot see, and those that are joining us uh, online either today or at your convenience later this week. Um, if you've not already done so, please fill out a welcome card so that we are, know that you have been here and leave it in the basket on the end of the pew at the center aisle so we can follow up with you in the week ahead. Now that we've heard God's word proclaimed, we're invited to respond. One response we have the opportunity for is in the offering of our gifts, our tithes. And here at Westminster, you may offer uh, the giving of gifts through Venmo, mailing a check to the office, or putting a check in the box over here as you leave the sanctuary. Please take a moment also to look over your announcements because this is another way to offer ourselves in service to God. They're listed in your bulletin. It provides special opportunities for you to get involved in the ministry of Christ at Westminster. In particular, this week, as we embark in the Lenten season, will you please keep the Westminster youth, Russell, Lauren, Danny, and Jake, in your prayers as they journey through the process of confirmation with Pastor Alex. Part of the process will be interviewing adult members of Westminster about their faith journeys. So would you please, whether you're here today or listening, as you contemplate this through the week, would you please let Pastor Alex know if you would volunteer to be interviewed by one of the youth? Now, as we move into sharing of joys and concerns, there's a Swedish proverb that says, shared joy is double joy, and shared sorrow is half sorrow. In relationship with one another, we have the opportunity to live into that by walking with one another in our joys and sorrows. So I now offer a moment that we might take a moment if you would like to offer any joys or sorrows, griefs or burdens that you bring with you this day that we might carry together. All right. As we come to prayer together, what I'll offer is that so we're more in this together, I'm just going to pray very simply and offer the names of joys and concerns and say, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray together. Jesus. 
Gracious and merciful God, we are grateful for this moment to trust in your awareness, in awareness of you, to trust in your presence. And we confess that when we don't know how to pray, we don't know even how to give voice to the concerns that are on our heart. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. For those burdens on our hearts that we do not know how to name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The troubles of Ukraine weigh on us all. And we do not know what to do. We do not know how to serve. We do not know how to give. And so we give our prayer. Our prayers for those who resist, both in Ukraine and Russia. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have already lost loved ones and suffer grief. In your mercy, Lord. We pray for the many, many, many displaced from their homes, traveling as you did across borders into unknown lands that long to reach out their arms and welcome them. We pray for all of them, O oh God, in your mercy. We pray for our world leaders. We admit sometimes that's really hard to do when we feel angry. But in fullness of relationship with you, we know that they also are beloved children. And we pray for awareness, a deep awareness of their true identity. Grant them wisdom. Grant them discernment in leading your peoples in peace and justice. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. And finally, for the griefs within this community, we lift up Jane. You're suffering cancer. We pray for diagnosis, for treatment, and for the healing of her mind, body, and soul. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. And we do not forget to give thanks for the joys of life, for new lives being born and lives that we celebrate this day. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. Right, I had to look at what was next. We're going to do communion now. As I come down here, I would like to say that we are going to, before the words of institution and our prayer, may I make a note of the process in which we'll engage, because I know you've been using pods uh, the last two years. <laughs> Today, I invite you to come forward. So after the prayer, the words of institution, you are invited to come forward. The choir will come first because they are going to sing while we receive communion. And then as you come forward, um, I will offer you bread with tongs. And um, you, there will also be individual cups for you to receive communion. Um, and you're welcome to receive it at the table or take it back to your seat and receive it there. Uh, for those of you online, you, we welcome you too. I don't know what you have available, but whatever it is, God provided it. So take it in for your nourishment and rejoice in the presence of God that we have this opportunity to receive. For you know, uh, Jesus was... 
He was a master at stories and metaphors. Knowing God nourished him in mind and body and soul, what better metaphor did he have than to become nourishment for us by taking in and absorbing these very ordinary elements that God has provided, we're reminded that humanity, humanity, friends, is not separated from God. As we believe in God, as we believe God's word, may we believe into the fullness of our identity in relationship with God by the grace that abides within Now, this is not a Presbyterian table. This is the Lord's table, and this table is inclusive because Jesus didn't ask who people were or where they came from when he fed the 5,000. He fed them all. He ate with men and women, with Jews and Greeks, Gentiles. He ate with Peter, who denied him, and Judas, who betrayed him. This table is abundant because Jesus knew he was abundantly nourished by God in more than one way, not just by bread alone. And he had a way of always having enough, more than enough. This table is joyful because Jesus always gave thanks, and this table is mysterious. Because though we are not separate from God, who can truly understand the grace of God? Let us pray. God, our creator, in an outward expression of your eternal joy and love, you made all things and sustained them by your power. Indeed, your presence is in all things, and you made your covenant with us, calling us to walk humbly with you, to do justice to love kindness in relationship with the whole of your creation. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, beloved child, one with you. Jesus Christ, the living bread, nourishing us to remember we are not separate from you. Jesus healed the sick. He offered life to sinners, and he walked with us in joy and in sorrow. And with love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms and surrendered his spirit. In his resurrection, the gifts of his spirit were poured out upon your people that the church might believe into him. Lord Jesus Christ, present with us now, we do in this place what you did in an upstairs room, calling us to remember we belong to you. Breathe your spirit upon us and this table, renewing and sustaining, making us whole by your grace. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Among friends gathered around a table, Jesus took the bread, and having given thanks for it, he broke it. Grace crumbled everywhere. And he said to his disciples, This is my body, which is given for you. In the same way, he took the wine, and having having given thanks for it, he poured it out. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, take this into you and share it. This is the cup of the new covenant with God sealed in my blood. I will drink 
wine with you next in the coming kingdom of God. So now, following Jesus' example, we take this bread and this wine, the very ordinary things of the world through which God will bless us. And as Jesus gave thanks for God's goodness, let us also give thanks. Come, the table is ready. bread of life. taking in nourishment, we want to trust that we, in fact, are not separate from you, O God. So we pray for love's sake to open ourselves to you. Let the Spirit fill us and transform us till the boundary between us and you no longer exists. This would be our fulfillment, Lord our God. Amen.
sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. If, in fact, dear friends, we are to believe we are not separate from God, if we are to believe in God's word that Jesus, fully human, was fully divine, to show us how to walk humbly with God, how to do justice and love kindness. What must we lay aside in this Lenten season to also believe into God? As you leave this place, may Jesus draw you into the flames of love, uniting with you so closely that you experience God living in and working through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.